um, bacteria have had a symbiotic relationship, uh, had a parasitic, had a symbiotic and parasitic relationship with humans for long periods of time. And it was found, 700-year-old feces was found in uh, ruins of South America and all over the world. And this bacteria was studied, and it was shown that there are viruses that use the bacteria as a host. And the viruses actually are able to input their DNA into the bacteria, and the bacteria themselves are able to adapt to their environment based on the DNA of the viruses. So the bacteria are using the humans as a host, and the viruses are using the bacteria as a host. And they're all exchanging DNA, which are increasing the variation for better or for worse for all these organisms. All right. Most importantly, it was found that some of the feces, uh, that it were human feces that were found in a fossilized manner, that the bacteria that was found in these human feces had um, species of bacteria that are known to secrete way more antibiotics than the current bacteria that we current the bacteria that we currently have in our intestinal tract, and. Also, that um, these ancient feces um, with housing the bacteria had more genes uh, that were resistant to pathogens than the bacteria that we have today. And one of the, th one of the reasons that is theorized to occur is because bacteria um, in the past um, have had, with, without the use of antibiotics, and especially humans, uh, humans themselves um, are not as resistant to as many pathogens as we are today um, because of one of the theories is the antiseptic nature of our environments. And this research was supported by a very popular research study looking at the group of Hadza in Tanzania. This is a kind of a hunter type gatherer primitive uh, village of people. And their intestinal tracts were studied and to have found that they have bacteria that more closely relate to the bacteria in the 700-year-old feces of the study above here that found the bacteria have more antibiotics and more defenses against uh, specific types of pathogens. Um, as compared to modern-day Westerners, it was found that the bacteria in their stomachs was, number one, less diverse, and number two, the bacteria had less genes that were able to uh, fight against other pathogenic bacteria viruses and other things as well. So bacteria and humans and viruses have had a very close relationship ever since uh, the beginning. And the beginning meaning that bacteria and multicellular organisms have a lot in common. It doesn't make any sense for the bacteria to necessarily kill their host because then they wouldn't have a place to live. So think about that. Uh, it's, it's more important for the bacteria to keep their host alive so that they can continue to live, reproduce, and spread. Um, there are a few different types of bacteria. Um, there are the spherical-shaped type. The three major uh, structural types are the, the, the spherical, the rod, and the spiral. The spirulum, the bacillus, and the coccus. Um, and there are a couple other more specific variations of these three. You could have um, Diplobacillus, Diplospirulum, Diplococcus. You have the Staphylococcus, um, which all we know as staph infection. You could have Streptococcus, which we know as uh, strep throat. And uh, viruses are very small. They're between uh, 5 to 50 micrometers. Sorry, this was a typo. 5 to 5, 0.5 to 50 micrometers as opposed to 10 to 100 micrometers of the eukaryotic cells. Um, these different groups, the rods, the spirals, and the spheres, uh, all include bacteria that we know as far as the spirochetes, uh, think Lyme disease. Uh, spirula is a very common, actually beneficial uh, bacteria that is used often in green substances. Um, they're not spirulina. I'm not talking about spirulina. Um, we also have streptobacilli, which is a, uh, also another pathogenic bacteria, and uh, streptococci, uh, which we know being a pathogenic strep throat bacteria, which actually can lead to death if not treated. So the three main groups are the, the spherical, the rod, and the spiral. A um, long time ago, um, going back to the 16, 17, and 1800s, it was common, uh, especially in the 1800s, to be shipping different resources um, from one place to another across the great ocean. Now, in the beginning, all right, 
a lot of the the shipping lanes that uh, that allowed for the movement of goods like sugar, cod, and rum, um, ivory, spices, um, cod being a big one, sugar, molasses, could not occur, all right, without special treatments. Um, one of the important things found as um, Great Britain was sending their beer to uh, soldiers in Africa is that the beer would usually go bad by the time it got there. So what they found was if you put more hops in beer, hops is like a vine-like uh, kind of um, very potent smelling and preservative substance, was found to keep the beer good against path pathogens and bacteria so that it could make the trip to Africa. And they ended up calling this an IPA, an India Pale Ale. Um, also important was cod was one of the major exports from the New World to Europe and cod was not able to be shipped long distances unless it was salted. And the salting uh, was, a, was found to preserve the cod for long periods of time because certain bacteria, most bacteria actually, are not halophiles, meaning they're not able to withstand extreme environments. And so salting of fish became a very important means of, uh, of exporting goods long distances. Names that you may hear, may you haven't, hear, haven't heard in the Northeast, Sandwich, Ipswich, and Harwich are all salt flats that basically had large amounts of salt that were able, that, um, that were used to salt the cod before bringing it back to uh, the European countries. So bacteria, humans, trade, slaves, cod, beer, sugar, rum, tobacco, are all actually related uh, in, in very intricate ways to the history of, of, of humans. So don't forget, uh, don't forget that kind of stuff. Um, one of the crazy things about bacteria is they uh, there's two major types of bacteria when it comes to their cell walls. So bacteria have cell walls. Or their cell walls are not made of the same things that fungi and plants are. In plants, they're made of cellulose. In fungi, the cell walls are made of chitin. But in bacteria, they have the cell membrane, and the gram-positive bacteria have a, a, a cell wall made of peptidoglycan, all right? And it's called a gram positive because this, when you stain it with a specific stain called a gram stain, the bacteria is actually able, the bacteria actually absorbs some of that gram stain in the peptidoglycan wall, all right? And this, the, the bacteria itself becomes stained. So it's called gram positive bacteria. And it is actually a way of separating bacteria into two major groups, all right? The other type of bacteria is the gram-negative bacteria. Now, the gram-negative bacteria do not take on the gram stain, all right, and have a lesser peptidoglycan wall, but what they do have is they have an even further outer membrane that's also, though, that's usually called a lipopolysaccharide layer. It's made of lipids, and it's also made of sugars, all right, and what this allows the cell to do is defend against a lot of things that the gram-positive bacteria cannot. Now, they both have their different types of advantages, all right, but, the, but often gram-negative bacteria have the lipopolysaccharide outer cell wall layer, all right? So even though we look back, we have three major groups of bacteria are the circles, the rods, and the spirals. Two major groups of bacteria that are not determined by shape are the gram-negative and the gram-positive bacteria, all right? Often... Um, bacteria have a capsule which is made of this poly, lipopolysaccharide layer that allows the organism to withstand very extreme environments like the human stomach, which may have a pH down to 2, um, or very hot, very cold, or very dry environments. Now, this exchange of genetic information also allows bacteria to become more diverse in getting the mutations of other bacteria and um, this also explains some of the rapid diversity and diversification of bacteria as they reproduce. All right. Endospores, now we talked about endospores when we, were look, when we were talking about the first slide. We looked at the bacteria that was able to house itself for 25 million years before, becoming, uh, before uh, coming out of its dormant stage. These endospores are a kind of an outer membrane coating of proteins and sugars that uh, allow the cell, and it's also very dehydrated as well, that allow the core of the bacteria to enter this dormant state and resist any temperature changes, salt changes, um, pH changes, anything that may 
lead to the destruction of the cell is protected by this outer membrane. It's called an endospore. The endospores are actually very common in bacteria, and they allow the bacteria to, to wait for an environment to become conducive to life. All right. Now, bacteria can move in a bunch of different ways. One of them is flagella. Um, it's the most common way of movement in bacteria. They have a specific structure made of microtubules that either spins or rows like a boat and allows the organism to move from one position to another. All right. Now, one, another question is, how do they know where to move? They don't really have any structures that are designed specifically to see things or whatnot, but they do move to and away from stimuli. All right. They often move towards things that are more uh, acidic or away things that are more acidic or towards things that are hotter or away from things that are hotter or towards a specific chemical that's in their environment or away from this chemical and that's called chemotaxis moving away or to or from a specific chemical in their environment that maybe is signaling a specific location or a specific environment they either want to be a part of or they want to avoid so this is called taxis so what exactly does a prokaryotic bacteria look like well we've seen bacteria a bunch of times uh, one of the things that they all have, that all cells have, is a cell membrane, uh, or also called plasma membrane here in the red, which is surrounded by a cell wall, or which is that peptidoglycan cell wall. The, the capsule on the outside can be made of many things. It can be made anything from peptidoglycan to uh, lipopolysaccharides um, to other sugars and other proteins that allow the cell to to withstand very, very, very harsh environments. On the inside, they've got, you know, their cytosolic substance. Um, I'm assuming yep, these things in the yellow are ribosomes, all right? so they're protein-making factories um, that are receiving instructions directly from the genetic material in the nucleoid region. Now, oftentimes, bacteria have circular DNA, also known as plasmids, uh, which are double-strand DNA that exists in a circular um, structure. Um, but bacteria are generally, generally very simple. Now, don't take their simple structure to mean that they're not complex or mean that they don't have very complex processes. Bacteria have been, have been able to withstand every type of environment and every adaptation of new organisms for over 3.5 billion years. So to say that one organism, uh, one, you know, say that a human is more advanced than a bacteria is, is a complete, complete overstatement. These bacteria are actually just as advanced as we are, and commonly humans and bacteria are going back and forth in their ability to um, kind of avoid one another's pathogenicity, or humans are trying to um, kill back to any bacteria that don't benefit it, and we also we have many bacteria that benefit um, our systems. And bacteria are always trying to find ways to get past our immune system. So it's a common back and forth at which nobody ever really wins. Um, organisms are just trying to reproduce here. Now there's uh, one of the ways that bacteria reproduce is called binary fission. All right, The uh, nucleoid region will duplicate and split in half and very simply the cell wall and cell membrane will begin to pinch and divide from then on and you'll have two new cells. It's a very simple process. Um, understandably because you don't have any organelles or nuclear envelope to deal with. Um, so the DNA actually just kind of moves towards one side um, of each new cell. And it's called binary fission. It's a very simple replicative cell division at which the offspring are often identical to the parents. Now one of the differences is that the replication machinery of bacteria isn't as advanced, so often the offspring end up with variations that the parents don't have. And this is uh, one of the reasons that which bacteria are able to acquire m more variation than humans because of their higher mutation rate. Um, there are a few ways where bacteria can acquire genetic variation. One of them we just talked about being binary fission. And another one which we talked about a few slides ago called conjugation, at which one one bacterial organism will exchange genetic information for another. All right. Uh, two more ways. One is called transformation. In transformation, we heard Frederick Griffith in Frederick Griffith's experiment where he identified 
some 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 transforming factor. What he found was DNA was actually picking uh, bacteria were picking up DNA from their environment. All right, they were they were taking in foreign DNA um, and and integrating that into themselves. So that's called transformation. Another way that bacteria commonly increase their genetic diversity is through something called transduction. Bacteria are often being the targets of viral infection. And what viruses do is they actually insert their DNA into the genomes of their host organism. And oftentimes bacteria will take this host organ, this viral DNA, incorporate it into themselves, and then rapidly divide, weaving new bacteria that now have this new DNA from the viral organism. So three major avenues of genetic variation in bacteria are transformation, picking it up from the environment, transduction, getting it from viruses, and conjugation, which is exchanging DNA with other bacteria. Sometimes they can be the same species, or oftentimes they can be different species, which is crazy. Um, we talked about conjugation a little bit before, but often bacterial cells have something called F factor. It's called fertility factor, and one has to be an F plus cell, and one has to be an F minus cell in order for them to extend their fimbriae or sex pili in order to fuse with the other cell and exchange genetic information. So our three ways of genetic variation are transformation, transduction, and conjugation. Oftentimes you can put binary fission in there um, because binary fission has a high mutation rate, but generally it's not one of the ways um, where cells increase their variation. They're really just trying to duplicate their DNA. All right. Um, bacterial organisms have many modes of nutrition. Uh, phototrophs are organisms that use light energy to make all the organic compounds that they need. Chemoautotrophs are those that um, can produce their own energy using chemicals from their environment, uh, often inorganic sources like sulfur, sulfur and phosphate. Photoheterotrophs are those organisms that use light energy to make, use light to make energy but they cannot use carbon dioxide as a source of carbon. So really what they're doing is obtaining carbon from their external environment, but they're using photosynthesis to make the, all the ATP that they need to put those carbons together. Um, on the other hand, our last one is a chemoheterotroph. Uh, chemoheterotrophs use organic and inorganic molecules for energy production, um, which is kind of what humans do in a way. They obtain carbon uh, and nutrients to make ATP and put those carbons in a specific way. Oftentimes, bacteria will actually use other chemicals other than carbon to do this, and we call them, they are also included in the chemo heterotrophs. All right. um, there are th three major groups of bacteria when it comes to use of oxygen. There are obligate anaerobes, at which bacteria, those bacteria that uh, die in the presence of oxygen and are not able to um, metabolize in the presence of oxygen. And these bacteria are descendants of, you can imagine, the bacteria that um, first colonized the earth or at least colonized environments where there was no oxygen. Um, you have obligate anaerobes, those obligate aerobes, which are those that need oxygen in order to uh, metabolize. And there are facultative anaerobes, those, or those bacteria that do not use oxygen, but in the presence of oxygen, they often can exist and sometimes can use it. Um, and there are many, many different types of bacteria. Uh, interesting one is the rhizobia, which are bacteria that live on the roots of plants. And what they do is they take in nitrogen and use energy created by the plant. So the plant gives them energy, but the bacteria give the roots nitrogen. So these are organisms that have something called a symbiotic relationship um, at which one organism either benefits and the other is harmed, that's called parasitism. You have one organism benefits and the other is unaffected, that's called commensalism. Or you have um, a relationship at which both organisms benefit, which is called mutualism, and is actually the, um, is the relationship that we see here with the rhizobia bacteria.